This is Writers on Film, the only podcast dedicated to books on cinema. Hello and welcome. My name's John Bleasdell. I'm a writer and critic, and today I'm going to be talking to Adam Neyman, the author of a whole bunch of books, Showgirls, a study of Paul Verhoeven's cult classic, a book on the Coen brothers, another one on Paul Thomas Anderson, and a new one which is about to come out about David Fincher. So we're going to be talking about all of that. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm sure you can find me. I, I'm betting you already follow me on Twitter anyway, but if you don't uh, it's at Dr. John T D R J O N T Y. Uh, if you enjoyed the episode, please remember to like, subscribe, and spread the word generally. But before you do any of that, please enjoy the conversation. You're in Italy right now? Yeah, yeah, I'm based in Italy. I've been in Italy for like 21, 22 years almost. That's lovely. Really nice. Yeah, it's really good. It's uh, very convenient for the Venice Film Festival as well. Um, so you'll be heading. So you'll be heading there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm looking forward to. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing June, which is uh, sure. I'm not sure. I, there's also a sense that I'm I'm kind of primed for disappointment with June because it just it just has all the ingredients of a disappointment. <laughs> I'm not sure why. This is a, a, a weird way to, to, to broach Dune, but but three or four years ago, so this is before Blade Runner uh, 2049, the TIFF Lightbox did a retro on Denis Villeneuve. And I don't work for TIFF. And yet they asked me to write the program notes, despite the fact that I'm very ambivalent about his films. And more to the point, no one there wanted to write them. It's like he's a He's an interesting problem because it's hard to be too declarative about him. Anyone who doesn't think that he's a gifted filmmaker and technician is just kind of wrong. I mean, the skill is absolutely there. But even though I've, I've, I've written about the films, I've thought about them, I teach Enemy in my Toronto film course, I still cannot, for the life of me, figure out what, if anything, is on his mind while he does these things. He's such a blank filmmaker. He's kind of like a savant to me. He's such mm. a good director, but he doesn't think for five minutes about what these movies are about. And that's how he can make something like Sicario. Like I've met Denny. He's a nice guy. To me, Sicario is such a reactionary, like unpleasant wing nut kind of movie. I don't think he thinks that. And that disconnect is just, for me anyway, the way I think about directors and, and, and project and authorship, I just, I, I have a hard time with it. So I don't know what he sees in Dune. I like what Lynch saw in Dune, which was he didn't see stuff that he liked. Liked. And so he fought <laughs> against it and made a movie that's really like at odds with the novel's tone, but like good for it. I like Lynch's Doom. And even though I think Villeneuve's might be better, I don't think I'm going to like it, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really interesting point. I was kind of, I was thinking about Black Hawk Down today because that always feels like a movie that sort of kind of evaded its own political oh, ramifications. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. I know it's I know it's been criticized, but it seems to get a pass from a lot of people. Yeah, he hugely gets a pass, but also it was a just pre-Iraq zeitgeist mm. movie, and that's not set in Iraq. It came out before 9-11. And uh, you know, it it's aged I think it was as bad as as bad as it always was in that level when it came out. I mean, it's not like time has made it more racist, but it's not aged well. No, you know? no, absolutely not. No. And I mean, Sicario, I think I would put in that same sort of category of a film I could watch and technically go, oh, I really like the way these scenes are done. And oh, yeah. Music totally. and the rest of it. But, but yeah, from a political point of view, kind of horrifying. Well, it's just so drenched in crocodile tears that movie it's like oh it's depressing that the beat goes on and so like, well without the beat going on you don't have the movie you don't have your your corpses hanging from overpasses and bodies stuffed in walls it's like very it's visceral and it, it gets you but I, I find it like quite quite grotesque and i find the uh, <laughs> the treatment of the emily blunt character is just this totally passive bewildered you know by by, by the book doesn't get it done kind of figure is just you know it, it, it's not it's it's not for me but even, know? The, even the film itself at the end sort of actually boldly states that it's just like you were just there to sign a yeah. piece of paper you know and that's it and, and sort of narratively it's the same thing 
I thought you were yeah. Clara Starling, but you're, you're you're absolutely not that. Well, and then again, I mean, believe me, a movie doesn't have to have positive or even like you know active characters with agency to be good. I just found that um, by the time she's got the gun pointed at, at Benicio, but you know can't pull the trigger or whatever else, I'm like, I don't know what this movie's perspective on weaknesses or if it's seeing you know a female in this role is inherently weak, but it's not dramatically compelling and it's just kind of ugly to me. But you know, when he makes to me when Denis makes something like Enemy, which is funny and a great Toronto movie living yeah. here it, it, it's it's you know just funny to see the architecture and the locations the way he uses them you know i'm, I'm fully on board and i actually kind of like blade runner because i just thought that it i thought it was carried by surprisingly good gosling performance i don't usually like him but i liked him in this part he's well cast well oh, i've got say, this is this is part of my anticipation slash dread of june is i found blade runner was in the abstract everything i wanted it to be right and in the actual watching experience really boring <laughs> and it, it just really, it was just like, God, do we need to see him get out of the car, walk to the house, go in the house, go to the room, go to the other room, go down a corridor, go to his apartment. It was just like, fucking edit it. So just, just, you know, start the scene a little bit later and let, let's, and it just seemed to be about someone walking around and that that was the it was almost like they wanted to to get back to what harrison ford had criticized the original blade runner for not having any detecting and they just wanted it to be nothing but him walking around and doing stuff well in that well in that sense it, it's a weird recognition of what still holds up about the original which is the downtime i mean but I mean, look, I didn't I didn't find the film particularly exciting, but it I don't know. It had a kind of like it had a kind of a bleak, bleak integrity to me. But no, I mean, a lot of people I know found it found it boring and a lot of people I know couldn't stand the Gosling performance. I usually can't stand him in anything else, but I kind of like him as a drone. It's, it's what he is. <laughs> a Disney Club re replicant. A, a drone trying to conjure up some emotions. I'm like, good casting. You know, <laughs> not bad. And again, I was a sucker. I mean, and I am a sucker. I was a sucker for a dilapidated Las Vegas and dilapidated Harrison Ford and the Elvis holograms and stuff. I was like, all right, you know, it's taken us an hour and 45 minutes to get to this point, but this is pretty fun. Any, anybody but Jared Leto and maybe it would have gotten over the top. Ooh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Speaking of bleak integrity, how did you, yeah. uh, how did you start in the writing business? How did you, you. Ble bleak, bleak integrity. <laughs> Maybe o o oblique integrity. No, I, don't, I mean, I got very lucky. I'm a, a kid of two journalists. When I was 12 or 13, my mom, Evelyn, uh, who I also got a lot of my movie taste from, certainly my love for bleak 70s movies, you know, like Invasion of the Body Snatchers and, 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 and Carrie and Chinatown, you know, I kind of grew up on those on the video shelf at home. And when I was 12 or 13, I was spending so much time reading books, like not just Roger Ebert, which I got at the library, which I think was age appropriate, but also like Stanley Kaufman and Pauline Kael, which were, I mean, didn't mean I was smart reading them. I was just trying to and struggling with some of the references and the illusions and the, the vocabulary. But I told my mom when I was 12, you know, I kind of want to be a, a film critic. And instead of being horrified, as she should have been, uh, she was like, okay. So, you know, she, mm. she, she, you know, my parents were both on board. They always asked me to talk about what I was watching and they would dutifully read, you know, when I would type up reviews when I was 13 or 14 of, you know, Pulp Fiction and stuff. And, you know, there's this hyperbolic, you know, hyperbolic high school prose, right? But also, I think because I consumed so much of it and a big influence for me was the, the guy who reviewed films in Toronto for the Globe and Mail, who's not famous internationally, but within Canada, he's sort of, I think, one of the more important film critics, a writer named Jay Scott, who was a, a very flamboyant, not always out gay, but um, towards the end of his life, recognized gay uh, film critic writing in Canada's national paper who had a real kind of set of subcultural interests and real irreverence sometimes about high art movies. I mean, he was a Kalian. I didn't, he didn't have Kale's taste, mm. but he had that same complicitous way of writing where he's like, I feel this way. So maybe you do too, you know? And, and I, I, I imbibed all that stuff. And pretty early on, when I was 15, 16, 17, I, I could approximate it, right? I guess <laughs> my first ever editor, it's a woman who I still owe a, a lot to named Catherine Tunnicliffe, who's not working in media anymore, as far as I know, in Toronto, because almost 20 years ago. She was the, the arts editor at iWeekly, which was a Toronto alternative weekly, one of the two at the time in the city, along with Now. Now Magazine still exists. iWeekly is, is dead. But, you know, she looked at some clippings that I'd done for university papers, 
Like I reviewed um, Croupier with Clive Owen and Lynn Ramsey's film Ratcatcher. And uh, I think maybe it was more the fact that a 19 year old had sought out and written about those movies more than the quality of actually writing about them. She said, I could do worse than to throw you at some new releases. And so in 2000, this was like, um, you know, I was a full-time university student, but you know, I'd get a, an email, which I could only check once a day at that point, you know, there's something screening on a Wednesday night. Can you go? I would call my, my phone at home and check my answering machine and, and see if I was, you know, being sent a movie. And I would go to mostly the kind of movies that you go to as a stringer. And there are movies that in some I mean, I have a file somewhere of everything I wrote for I Weekly over the years was hundreds of pieces over the years, but you know, like third tier horror movies, Saturday morning, you'd go see family stuff, but also some really arty things. And the lead critic, who's one of my favorite people in the world, still Jason Anderson, who writes for Cinemascope and Sight and Sound and Mojo, and we're still very good friends. He saw me coming. And as a guy a few years older, he could have been super territorial. I mean, I was 20. Mm. You know, and, and Jay at that time would have been 25, 26. And, you know, he was writing the lead pieces, the 900 word, 1200 word pieces. And I was writing the 200, 300 word reviews. And instead of being defensive, he just said, hey, let's share pieces. We let's, let's become friends. Let's have taste. Can't overstate what that meant at the time. And then the first year I covered TIFF, which was also the year of September 11th, which was just a bizarre set of memories yeah. uh you know i managed to do i managed to do some things like interview david lynch when i was 20 and write about mulholland drive and i think that that and a few other pieces the the magazine started trusting me and it was almost like jason and i traded off on on lead features and assignments and then some other magazines in canada reached out because at that time it's like a cool young writer thing 20 years later that seems so far away i just want to vomit i mean i'm old now and tired <laughs> but 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 at 20 you know this was pretty heady stuff and you never thought about how much exhibition was going to change how much distribution was going to change about the, how much the role of the critic was going to change when advertising disappeared and then you lose interview opportunities but this was a time where you sort of felt like oh man i just gave uh you know uh, claire peplow's triumph of love three and a half stars that means 20 more people are going to go see it at the carlton theater in toronto and whether that was true or not that was how it felt right very romantic set of memories there so with that sort of grounding you 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 have because i feel like if somebody's starting today and i might be wrong but if somebody's starting today i feel that there's a sort of weightlessness to the totally to the thing that everybody's got an opinion everybody's got a thing and and nobody will as you say affect sort of box office by you, maybe you'll you'll just join the avalanche but you, other than that you're just a snowflake there's, yeah, there are sometimes individual critics or individual pieces or individual reactions against critics and pieces that feel like they kind of move the needle. I mean, to use a really contemporary example, it legitimately has been people on Letterboxd writing about The Empty Man that got that film then coverage in actual mainstream outlets and precincts, which in turn may have some, some effect on like its status, like will it ever be on Blu-ray or will it be added to a high-end streaming service? Or I guess within contemporary horror, will it sort of be canonized? And it's not overstating the case. I'm not like some letterbox review of The Empty Man is not Pauline Kael's review of Nashville, but like it does still happen that interesting people saying interesting things about interesting movies, you know, can make a difference. I've seen it happen on the ground at festivals, or I've seen it happen in the virtual nexus of, of the internet. I mean, I, I mean, I've always thought that we are living, each year it becomes more true that there's more good film criticism being written than at any point in history, but that's just because there's more film criticism being written, and there's also more bad film criticism being written than, than at any point in history, and it really becomes overwhelming to try and scan or have any, like, overarching sense of the terrain. And I think the people who pretend to uh, don't because even some of the really smart critics, really good ones, salaried ones or tenured ones have a certain amount of contempt for Letterboxd and they shouldn't because there's really good stuff. I mean, there's unbearable stuff on Letterboxd. There's stuff on Letterboxd that does make you want to blow your brains out, but that's because it's a user-generated site. You know, no one's making money doing it. I mean, I guess the Patreon people are. And then similarly, the kids or young people on Letterboxd or old people on Letterboxd are on forums or on Twitter who say, you know, contemporary film criticism is bad and film critics should be, you know, executed or whatever they're not actually reading good people they're there mm, so i'm yeah. i'm very optimistic and positive about the state of play but that's in the larger context of as you say there's a weightlessness there's a lack of pull there is a kind of lack of gravity i think that also ties into this feeling correct or not that 
most movies aren't worth writing about, which I don't agree with, but I feel it anyway. I don't think it's true, but I understand where the feeling comes from, and I and I am suffused by it several times a month, especially if I'm reviewing new releases. Yeah, I mean, I I just got back from. I'm not sure if you you went to Cannes this year. No, I, I wish. I want to know how Benedetta actually is because I don't trust anybody. Yeah, it's not it's not great. Um, <laughs> uh, I, well, okay. Well, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of my review, which is, it's just too clean. It's it's really right. pre- it's really pre- predictably shocking. And the most shocking thing Verhoeven could have done would have been to actually sort of take it a bit more seriously and actually do something which wasn't just so so obviously. I mean, the question is now, who are you provoking? And and as I say, it's just all clean. It's like a soft porn. It's like a Zalman King, you know, um, <laughs> version of the Sound of Music. I mean, he's a good filmmaker to bring up if we're going chronologically through my own writing, because Showgirls was obviously the movie that I wrote my first book about. Right. There were interstitial things between being a 20-year-old stringer and a 31-year-old with a book contract. But, you know, Showgirls was a big deal. It was like a good movie to pick. And it felt like I was going out on a relatively short limb doing it and whatever else. And it also creates this thing. I don't know if you have it yourself as a as a critic, but, you know, you 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 can have a certain amount of success, but also certain amount of uh, frustration when you get boxed in, whether it's as a no tourist or a genre specialist or there's a particular kind of movie that you, you're you known for. Mm. I mean, I have not been self-effacing about Showgirls. I've written a book that has two editions and I've toured with the movie and shown it. But then also, you know, sometimes whenever Showgirls comes up, people bug you or text you or whatever else. And it can feel like you're, you, you, you've you reduced yourself to that or you've kind of flattened your, yourself to that. So like, yeah, I didn't go to Cannes, but I'm such a cliche that on a podcast when I find out someone did go to Canada, like so what do you think of the Verhoeven movie <laughs> and you're 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 trapped by that stuff to to an extent it was a big door opening thing for me mm-hmm. uh I think I've lived up to it but I don't quite know if I'm gonna not only live the movie down but live down the fact that every time I show showgirls in Toronto my mom comes and asks a question and identifies <laughs> herself as such which is great she she never not done it oh, but uh God. yeah and she I... she's very she's very fond of uh of know me now She's made her peace with the fact that I wrote a book on showgirls and now she just really likes know me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> she I, should. I had to block my mum on Twitter because she would, uh, she would, I mean, bless her heart. She would relentlessly retweet my stuff with little oh. comments and stuff. And it was just like, mum, no, I, I don't need this. I don't need you in every part of my life. So I'm afraid. That's sort of that. That's that's sweet though. Come on. Yeah. I, it's like the Angelica Houston uh, in Royal Tenenbaums keeping a book of clippings of Owen Wilson's stuff. You know, it's that kind of, it's right. nice and everything. But also, I just cringe. So I, I just thought I'm just going to block you, and I did. And that, I also, I also thought that was funny. It, it, it is, but he'll be grateful for those clippings when everything has disappeared from the internet. <laughs> That's true. I've yeah. kept, I've, I've kept all the iWeekly stuff just because I can't reference it anymore. And as much as I might cringe at some of the the writing or the taste, I, I, I want factually to know that it was there. Yeah, yeah. I think aware of the generation where um, having something physically present is yeah. important i can't i can't leave everything in the cloud no no not, neither neither can i hence this overcrowded office from which i am uh, from which i'm talking to what made you choose showgirls as your first book then obviously somewhere in the recesses of my brain it was a great idea because <laughs> uh you know it's a movie that's so famous for being bad that if you make the argument for being good there's a certain perverse curiosity that gets raised i think that one of the things i tried to get across in that book and if i had another crack at writing the book from scratch i might make this even more central is that really relevant reclamations need time and it's not possible anymore i mean we mm-hmm. now deal with backlash and reclamation and redemption on cycles of a week or even a couple of days there's backlash to pre-release reviews of films and people online start hating movies based on who's reviewed them, not even what the review is. I won't say any of the names out loud because it's embarrassing, but there's certain critics who just, they, for some people I know, their praise of a film means the film is just immediately suspect. Now that was true back in the days of Saris and Kale and the Paulettes and all that, but it's just so instant now. Mm. So, I mean, with Showgirls, you have a rare case of something that's like total consensus one way and then a total shifted consensus the other way. And every time I've showed Showgirls, everyone's like, why did anyone ever think this was bad? And it's a question that makes me happy. But if they hadn't thought it was bad, I couldn't have written the book. 
right? Right. I mean, it was a, it was a, it was, it, it was a combination of like, this is a savvy idea. This fits for the pop culture series that this publisher ECW has started, which were meant to be these kind of very passionate, argumentative monographs. And, you know, I was the first one that they approved. And uh, yeah, I think it was just in in line with a kind of a couple of of, of shifting tides in in criticism, you know, and I wrote, I didn't start those tides at all. I wouldn't mean it's such a ridiculous thing to even say that out loud. Of course I didn't. I'm riding those tides. And the, the, the showgirls reclamation efforts had begun years ago. You know, academic critics, queer critics, feminist critics, you had real lovers of trash like John Waters. And then at the higher end of the spectrum, you had the great director Jacques Rivette, who always said that he thought Showgirls was wonderful. And, you know, I kind of duly cited all these people in the book. It's really actually a book that's a lot about citation and and reception and measuring what different people said about the films at different times. But also, I genuinely loved it when I saw it as a teenager, maybe not with the same language I would have for it now. I wasn't 14 being like, oh man, what did Jacques Rivette think about this? You know, I was like 14 (laughs) and, and thinking that it was hilarious. But what I sort of tried to get across in that book is that it's not a question of so bad, it's good. It's sort of a question of complete, uh, this weirdly complete, completely transparent hyperbole that the movie operates on. It's both things at the same time. I think you can clearly see it as failed camp. And I think you can see it as as wonderfully sharp satire. And I don't think that one eliminates the other. You know, the mm. in, in my MA at U of T, right before I wrote the Showgirls book, it's funny because I wrote my MA thesis on Verhoeven, but not on his American. American films. I wrote it on his Dutch films. And because in the MA, you're not writing evaluative criticism, you have to write the kind of scholarship that you can justify working for six months on and that a PhD professor can, you know, take it a task for. I wrote about Verhoeven's relationship to the picaresque, to this pre-novelistic literary form that's all about grotesquerie and excess and sex and satire, and that all of this bodily excess is like a, a tour through a romantic landscape in the Middle Ages that's not actually romantic. Mm. And, you know, when Verhoeven made flesh and flesh and blood. That's literally what he was doing. He was like, "Hey, look, here's shit and and tits and 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 gore and rape and whatever else. It's what the period might actually look like." Um, but his his Dutch films had a lot of that too. And so you know, writing about. Turkish Delight and Kadi Tippel and Fourth Man and especially Spetters as a sort of modern chivalric romance with motorcyclists instead of knights. You know, I had a lot of that stuff in mind that in the grotesque, it's not funny or horrible. It's both. And you right. can't have something that is genuinely grotesque in the sort of Rabelaisian sense of, of you know, Gargantua and Pangrel. You know, you can't have it if it's not funny and disgusting. And I think Showgirls for two hours and 11 minutes is a genuinely grotesque American guided tour. And I think it's one of, in its way, one of the greatest films I've I've ever seen. And it it is, even though there is so much about it that you could argue exceeds or fails intention. And Paul, I shouldn't call him Paul, though I know him. I mean, Verhoeven um, has told me. Paul, let's, let's, please. Let's, now that, that that's that's the sort of thing that people will tweet about the podcast. They'll go, "What an asshole!" Call Paul. I mean, <laughs> what, what Verhoeven what Verhoeven has said, including to me, both on the record and in private, and and said to many people, is that he feels that he, in some ways, failed his direction of that film. He he thinks the Berkeley performance got out of control. There were things that he and Esther Haas were going for that weren't realized. He is also smart enough, and I believe he is honest when he says this. It's not opportunistic. He said, "I still love the movie, and I love watching it." And in some ways, for him, it gets closer to what he was going for in his American movies than any of those movies. And I would also say, and I don't know what you think about this, that if Berkeley's performance in that movie isn't what it is, no matter how well shot, edited, no matter how great the supporting performances are, all the craft that I think is second nature to him, because I think in his way, he's a great classical filmmaker, Mm. all that stuff would not matter. If it's a better lead performance, the movie is not, the movie's nothing. Yeah. The yeah. performance is awe-inspiring. It's mm. awe-inspiring the way that Maria Montez is awe-inspiring or the way that, you know, some of the acting in, in Beyond the Valley of the Dolls is awe-inspiring. It's awe-inspiring. And that's not a put-down. It can't be. It's a compliment. It's a particular kind of compliment, but it's a compliment. If that's one of the greatest films I've ever seen for me, and Elizabeth Berkeley is the reason why, ergo, it's one of the greatest performances I've ever seen in its way. Right. And I believe that I believe that very strongly. And I sort of tried in writing the book more than any because Verhoeven's like a, a scummy genius auteur who you know gets to be reclaimed now as an art filmmaker with with, with Black Book and L and maybe with Benedetta. But I mean, Berkeley really took the fall. And I tried in the book to be like, I love Elizabeth Berkeley in this. I love her. 
And, uh, you know, it's fine line to walk because loving her in this case doesn't necessarily mean thinking the performance fully works, but trying to, but, but man, if you want to see how mean film critics can be and not the good kind of mean, I mean, the kind of mean where you got these men working through stuff. That's just so ugly. Mm. You go read what daily movie reviewers said about Elizabeth Berkeley and showgirl It's shocking. Mm. Mm. And they wouldn't write it now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, I, absolutely. No, I, I see what you mean. No, I mean, I can remember, I mean, I remember when the film came out. Uh, I didn't see it on its original run. In fact, I saw it um, only like two or three two years ago i think oh really but, yeah what i was doing was i was i was doing a film club for the university where i teach here in venice and we watched the room and as, as someone had suggested let's watch a really terrible movie because we've watched all these great movies so i said well this is the sort of the epitome or the nada of, of terrible movies so we watched the room and then after a few more movies someone said let's watch another terrible movie well i said I haven't seen the, the Showgirls, but it's it's got this reputation. So we watched it there. And it was really interesting how it, it just the way you framed it as it's not so bad, it's good. That That isn't the, you know, if you put it side by side with the room, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't no, not at all. That way. No. So you can't, so it, it, a phrase you used as well, a, a failed camp comes to mind where it's it's just not, it's not doing what the room is doing. And I liked in, in your sort of, when you were talking about it, you, you kept putting in these sort of little caveats about in its way, in the way it does, you know, it, and it's like a paradigm shift. You kind of have to, to shift. And, and the contradiction I feel is for Hoven, exactly what you said, that he's a really classical, he's a very smooth director. I mean, the, Absolutely. The, the images are smooth. It, they're it's obvious there's a real craftsman at work making these films and and yet he often puts material which is in completely at odds with that smoothness so you starship troopers would be a really good example of something that looks incredible star warsy or star trekky and then it does these these outrageous sort of buggy gory and, stuff. and when and when he does these things in the context mostly of violence he's recognized by american critics as a satirist when the excesses have to do with sex and sexuality i mean in the case of basic instinct which was an effective movie they got everyone angry at him and in the case of showgirls whose effectiveness i think is of a slightly different kind or that doesn't have a solid let's say uh, a solid a kind of built-in genre Genre around it. I mean, Basic Instinct is like a Hitchcockian movie with boobs, and that works. And Showgirls is like a Busby Berkeley movie with boobs, and I think it, it's it's chancier. But when he does that, when he does that, it tends to make people either like very mad or or very kind of sarcastic. You know, I I <laughs> I think that now. He's, and having not seen Benedetta yet, when I watch something like Elle, you ask this rhetorical question, you know, who are you, who, who's he provoking? And at least in Elle, I thought the answer to that was pretty clear, which he's provoking the kind of audience that would come to see an Isabel Compare movie. And I think quite hilariously, but her performance has the same energy that Berkeley's does Showgirls, to be honest, she's an older character, older woman. She's not in the context of Vegas showgirls, although her job in Elle is pretty insane. She's like a video game designer for these like pornographic, you know, medievalist video games. You talk about him as a picaresque filmmaker. The video game in Elle is all about dragon slaying and stuff. Cooper has a different control of her instrument, let's say, than Elizabeth Berkeley does. But I mean, both of those movies are driven by these relentless, impulsive, contradictory, in some ways kind of impossible female uh, protagonists surrounded by moronic men who hate them and they direct that, that hate sort of back at them. And, and both movies are pretty bleak cultural satires. It's just what he's satirizing in Showgirls is the dumbness of 90s Hollywood. And in Elle, he's kind of satirizing, I think, the preciousness or the tidiness of a kind of art house. You know, he, I, I've never printed this, but it's good. I'll give it to you for your podcast. <laughs> which is that when I met with him in Florida, in uh, in uh, Key West, I asked him, I said, so what do you watch these days? Because he's got, he's got very classical taste. Whenever he does lists for sight and sound or whatever, I mean, it's good stuff. And you can tell it's what he would like. He likes Wells and Olivier, and he likes Polanski, and he likes Fellini. I think Showgirls is an attempt at a Fellini satiricon kind of movie. So I said, what do you watch? And he said, I really like Michael Haneke. And he said, I really like The Hangover. 
And just very quickly, I said to him, well, of course, because you're in the middle of those two things. You know, when when, when you're making L, <laughs> you're making a, you know, you're, 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 you're kind of making a Hanukkah movie right down to Huper, but you're always going to be the hangover guy. And I can't, I mean, I can't say that that's the only like on-ramp to my taste. I like lots of different kinds of directors and different kinds of movies. But that idea of something with that kind of control, that's also so unapologetic and unabashed about its excess and its fetishism and, and kind of about its stupidity really, really appeals to me. He's a shameless director, not just in the sense that he's shameless for what he throws at you, but he has no shame himself about what he makes movies about. He, he doesn't have hangups. You know, no, no, absolutely not. And, and that's why I think that he's closer to a guy like Bunuel, who, depending on what day of the week I use, my favorite filmmaker of all time, he, he, he's closer to a guy like Bunuel than people will often give him credit for. So how can you put those people in the same sentence? That's sacrilegious. And I'm like, well, if you like Bunuel, you'd know that nothing's sacrilegious or that being sacrilegious is, <laughs> is the point. Being sacrilegious is the point. So I would teach Benwell and Verhoeven side by side. I think Benwell would look at the scene in The Fourth Man where Jerome Crebe imagines the guy, you know, as a naked Jesus on the cross and he's in the back of his mind, he kind of wants to suck him off. I'm like, I think Benwell would like that. And I'm sure that Verhoeven likes Benwell. So, um, you know, those those two exist on a kind of continuum for me in terms of, of my taste. I think Benwell would be harder to write a book about because there's a lot of really, really good ones already. Whereas mm. with No Girls, long answer to your question. I mean, just no one had done it. So why not do it? We were talking with another guest, Tom Schoen, the, the first guest on the podcast. And we were talking about the book industry in terms of publishing film books and he was just saying about how you have to pick these big directors and you've done that with the the coen brothers yeah. and with paul thomas anderson and one of the actually one example i don't want to anticipate too much but one example was tom was saying who else would you would could you you know tarantino who else could you do and he was he actually offered off oh, I'd like to think you could do a book about David Fincher and get a, a deal, uh, uh -oh. but, but, it, but I don't know if you'd be able to just in terms yeah. of name recognition and the things, but you but that's your, that's going to be your, your next book, I guess. It is. I mean, it's done and, uh, for better or worse, it's done. I wrote it pretty much over a period exactly analogous to the pandemic. I mean, I'm beyond grateful to have this relationship that's a, a sort of three-way relationship with Abrams and Little White Lies. These, right. You know, the, the Cohen book was sort of a test balloon that I think went well. I think that of the three, the Coens are the filmmakers who I gravitate towards the most naturally. It's not about ranking or better. Or, I mean, there's too much rhetoric about those filmmakers in terms of things like ranking and greatness anyway, which if you read the books, I, I don't do. But the Coens for me have always been filmmakers who, and it's very presumptuous, but as viewers, you know, no one can tell us we're wrong in our own head. I've always watched their movies since about the mid nineties and thought like, oh, this is for me. They are so much smarter, I think, than even their, I mean, I've interviewed interviewed them, not for the book, but I've interviewed them and they're smarter than, than me and probably you, which is not meant to be rude. They're very smart. And so in some ways, the, the book seems pointless. You're not going to say anything with the movies that the movies don't know themselves. But I also think then when I would see people write about them and write about condescension to their characters or cruelty or these filmmakers lack character or their work is uneven, I would sort of say, I, I don't feel that way at all. So you could argue the world doesn't need a, a big testament to the quality of, you know, Fargo at this point, but you're going to write about the career, you write about all the books, you integrate the popular reception, the academic reception with some of your own somewhat eccentric ideas about them. And that all got synthesized, I think, pretty well. And I think in that book, I would stand behind the interpretations of the films, not necessarily as being correct, because that's hubristic, but like, I'm confident in them, I feel them, you know, these have right. always been what, what those movies have meant to me. And even a movie like Inside Lewin Davis, I remembered thinking an hour after I saw it, like that movie had been with me for a long time. And that's not just thinking it's good or how many stars you would give it, it's just there's something in that movie's bones in its in its consideration of failure and 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 solitude and cultural shifts and, and should people be, are you a writer? or are you an interpreter do great artists need to be alone or are you part of a part of a collective are you do you have to be a dick in order to show people that you're talented i was like i feel like i've been living with this movie for a long time and so that book kind of just flowed out of me and in some ways i think of the three filmmakers the coens are the easiest sell internationally because even though they 
don't have big budgets, not not as big budgets as Fincher. Somehow, everyone in the universe has seen Fargo. Everyone has seen The Big Lebowski. And probably because of the Oscar, everyone has seen No Country for Old Men. Uh, I think Fincher's had the biggest hits out of the three filmmakers, or, or some of the biggest hits and biggest budgets, and the closest thing to being a kind of franchise filmmaker with The Dragon Tattoo. And, and I mean, Gone Girl's not a franchise, but it's a bestseller, you know, sure. closer. But I feel like the Coens are the most universally admired and that made that also kind of easy too anderson and fincher I'm, and i'm not you know if abrams is listening i'm just being honest i mean they were harder sells i think they were slightly harder sells for me to the publisher and then maybe harder sells internally for the publisher but what we found out immediately when the anderson book came out and did and continues to do pretty well there's an incredible amount of warmth and love for that filmmaker. Yes. There's alienation and there are people who think he's a big fat fraud and there's interesting criticism to whether Anderson is a bit of a fraud or a phony or a poser. But the people who love him, there's warmth. And it is, if you read it, a very warm book. It's not positive necessarily. It's a lot, I'm very critical of those movies, but mm. there is a warmth to the way the book is designed and a warmth to what works about those movies. David Fincher is not Mr. Warmth in the movies. <laughs> and I think Mank, I think I think Mank in particular has made a lot of cinephiles and historians and Wellsians, you know, really like dislike him intently. And his fan base is also, from some point of view, not a terribly likable one. I mean, Fight Club is like the ultimate dorm room film bro four horsemen of the apocalypse kind of title. Like you would put it on that mm. list with Memento and and Pulp Fiction, you know, which means it's in their class as a cultural flashpoint, but it's not not a warm one. Even The Big Lebowski, which I happen to think is the Cohen's best movie and also easily their most annoying, most annoyingly oversaturated title. Who could actually not like it for me? Mm -hmm. Who could actually watch The Big Lebowski and what that movie is saying and what its vibes are and be like, well, I still don't like it. I think with Fincher, there are a lot to dislike, mm -hmm. uh, not to not admire and not to just dispose with, I mean, to try and plunge into. But yeah, I mean, a filmmaker like that, it's funny. The, 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 uh, people said, they said, so what what movie do you think that is going to get people to buy this book? And I'm like, for better or for worse, it's still probably fucking Fight Club. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. The, the a movie that wasn't even a hit. Yeah, no, it, it, but really bad timing, really weirdly marketed and, and disappointing box office. But disappointing box office, but a cultural, I don't want to say footprint, like a cultural handprint, a cultural knuckle... <laughs> Nothing, a, 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 cultural, a, a cultural knuckle sandwich that in some ways he's moved past, but in other ways, and in writing the book, this was really clarified for me, you know, in, in other ways just cuts exactly to the heart of what is both phenomenally compelling and, and hugely alienating about this particular filmmaker in the same way that it's, and I think, I don't think that there's spoilers on this podcast anymore. If anyone hasn't seen Fight Clubs at this point, yeah, sorry, yeah. but you know, in, in the same way that your, your protagonist is split and his, his subconscious both exceeds him in terms of knowledge of the way the world works, but is also kind of limited to his own knowledge of the way the world works. I mean, he's an insurrectionist, but he builds it like a franchise, like a corporate franchise. I mean, the yeah. space monkeys are built in the same image that, that Norton's day job is in because you're, you're, the voice in your head can't know more than you do, right? So, right. So, in the same, so in the same way that Fight Club is sort of self-divided between these, these two characters, each of whom want what the other has. I mean, he wants Tyler's impossible sexiness and handsomeness and agility and rhetoric. And Tyler's like, I'm not real i would just like your body can i have it you know he in the same way that it's self-divided it's also divided i think between fincher the cultural critic and phil fincher the salesman it's a movie full of sales pitches and commercial commercial pitches i was having a conversation with another filmmaker who knows david fincher very well david Pryor, who made the empty man we were talking about fight club we were saying it's in the same way that it's two protagonists in a movie and depending on who you think is the main character it's a different movie i'm like you could describe it with the same sentence just what do you what order do you put it in do you say i can't believe that a movie like that that's about what it's about was made by a studio or do you say i can't believe a movie that's about that and 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 about about it the way it is it was still made by a studio mm. You know, it's it, right, how, yeah. how, how subversive is it really in its form and its release and its existence in, in the world? I'm not saying it's nothing, but there's a sort of a, you know, 
can you really fight your way out from the belly of the beast? Can you really make a movie with the global towers of finance collapsing when you also need to open on 2,500 screens? Right. And I don't have an answer to that. But to me, that's a lot more interesting than saying anyone who likes Fight Club is a brain dead film bro. And it's also a lot more interesting than saying this is the greatest movie ever. And if you don't like it, you're a snowflake. You know, I mean, it, you try and find the middle ground. That's what's crazy about the way we talk about films these days. And, and you know, you, you referenced it in terms of film as well as Anderson and Nolan gets this as well of this sort of film broness and I just it just feels like a, a real depletion of how we how we talk about that but it, the difference when it comes to Fight Club as compared to sort of Pulp Fiction or Memento or those other films that, that sort of the posters on the wall of the university dorm is that it actually stands as this also this sort of proto manifesto for incels so you have that on top of it oh, yeah. which, which is satirized but also satirized in a way which is so refined might not be the right word but it's incredibly easy to not get it and I think part of that not getting it is actually part of the structure of the film itself you know the satire isn't decisive no well there's a very stiff upper lip British critic writing in a very you know finger up to the lip kind of publication it was Alexander Walker and I think the Evening Standard at Cannes who was like this is a fascist movie and it was like the greatest publicity Fight Club ever got because you know <laughs> It describes accurately the outer form and outer shape of the movie while not attempting to even probe the, even if it is kind of a fascist movie, the, the reasoning isn't probed. And someone might say, you don't have to probe the reasoning. You can probe the reasoning of triumph of the will all you want. It's not going to give you a happy answer. The outer form is still what the movie is. And that's the risk that Fincher uh, ran right. in making this film featuring an unfathomably charismatic, you know, Marshall, che, you know, Brad Pitt as a kind of mix of Kurt Cobain and, and Che Guevara. He, 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 he risks that. He risks it being a successful kind of uh, a successful kind of sales pitch. And I have a lot of friends who, who thought that the film, uh, oh, then and now they, they say the film is incoherent and I would sort of say because it's not really one of my favorites of Fincher's movies though I tried to do right by it in the chapter in the book I sort of go well you know how what, what what's the staying power of coherence especially for popular political cinema a movie that's uh, immediately coherent or ideologically satisfying often sometimes has a very narrow cast appeal mm. where it doesn't give you much to do with it except kind of nod approvingly at it. I think that in, in a way, Fight Club, I think Fight Club kind of was Fincher trying to show that he had a he had some thoughts in his head after the, you know, movies like like Seven in the Game, which are so brilliantly realized and for some people kind of thin, although I don't think that either of them are, but that was the criticism is that they're kind of thin. You know, and I'm not sure that Fight Club's like cultural diagnosis is is that apt, but you had on some level, you have to appreciate the crash test dummy act of the filmmaking and this is not like white hot insight or anything but re-watching the film a couple of times i was just stunned by the amount of setups in that movie the mm. sheer number of setups locations angles perspectives never just settling for shot reverse shot when he doesn't have to never just settling for two or three you know points of coverage in a in a particular location i mean it's just so relentlessly alive as a piece of craft that hasn't changed in his filmmaking and he's not the only filmmaker who does that but the the size and the sense of building out a world and building out a point of view on, on these characters really just kind of startling especially since it's right on the pivot point between analog and digital both for films in general, but for Fincher, for sure. Because after Fight Club, he decisively maneuvers towards the digital. All the panic room was shot on film, but all the CGI camera movements were sort of pre-visualized. And they're impossible camera movements. They're disembodied camera work. They're not meant to make you feel like there's possibly a cinematographer there. And then Zodiac begins that late phase of his career where all of a sudden history and reality and time and verisimilitude become, I think, what he's more or less interested in, even in something like Dragon Tattoo. And you get that digitality, which means that even a movie as gory as Dragon Tattoo for me feels bloodless. That's not even a put down, but it's a feeling mm. that is mm. built into those movies. I mean, I don't know. People talked about Dragon Tattoo and Gone Girl when they like them. They say they like them because of that incredible speed and sense of convergence. And the people who don't like them feel there's no friction in them. Like their exploitation movies or gore movies where nothing actually looks like it hurts. It's all, it's all very artificial. Violence without actual pain. 
Whereas Seven as an analog movie about an a- about in its plot, an analog craftsman carving art into bodies and limbs that's mostly makeup effects. That's where that movie's power comes from is, I mean, I'm not being incredulous and I'm like, oh my God, it looks real, but it's a very embodied tactile kind of horror. You know, it, you, you feel it while you're watching it. I mean, I think the, the the thing with Fight Club, and then we'll then we'll move back and have a look at the the Coens and, and Anderson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, and it, I mean, in some ways, it relates to to the Coens as well. It's it's about looking at the film, but it's also the, the the film is sort of discovered by the audience, and so it's that interface. And and as you did with Showgirls, it changes. It's like the sort of quantum state. It's like an uncertainty principle, you know. And if there isn't a critical atmosphere ready for a film, then it changes. It can be two things at the same time. And then when there is a critical atmosphere, it becomes one thing or another. And I think that moves along. So Alexander Walker saying it's fascistic. Yeah, he's not wrong. Clockwork Orange is fascistic, perhaps even more so. Maybe all films about young men being violent and maybe we should allow them to be violent are fascistic. But you have to sort of, the audience also has to sort of get in there somehow and and that interface becomes an important aspect of the film you know as much as as much as you know the the mise-en-scene or or, or whatever else well i was well i was trying to think what a common denominator between these three abrams books might be and beyond the cynical calculus of yeah enough people like these movies that they'll buy a book and the somewhat self-interrogating calculus of these are all white male american filmmakers of a certain generation which has to do with the availability and popularity of the films and maybe about how narrow my own taste formation is, though it's not remotely uh, the limit of what I watch, think about, write about, care about. But the other common denominator might be, uh, and this is more true of the Coens and Fincher than for Anderson, but I think I can make the case for all three, of scrupulous control and airlessness in the service of something spacious for the viewer, you know? I think the Coens make films that are airtight, but they are spacious for the viewer. And not in just in that chin stroking way of what is this all about, but you can move around inside those movies and you can move around inside those performances and inside certain moments. Uh, what t- where I tend to tune out with the Coens is critics, even when they like them, they propose this kind of one-to-one ratio between like, they don't like their characters or these characters are dumb, or this is a symbol of this. And I sort of think, I don't think the movie's made that way. And I think that Fincher, when he is good, like Zodiac, which is not just good, but for me is like a a, a, a more than it's some of its parts masterpiece. He's a very some of the parts filmmaker. Mm. You know, the movies add up. Zodiac somehow adds up to more than the integers that are in it. It has that ineffable quality where it it, it actually elevates beyond how good it, it is, how good the intentionality of the filmmaking is. It becomes something bigger because of what it's about, I think. But you can move around a lot in that movie. And I think Anderson is much less of a kind of like rivet and steel kind of filmmaker, but he is a formal virtuoso, you know. He doesn't like to trap his characters. He likes to roam, but it's still kind of big dick control freak filmmaking more than either of those filmmakers i think he dares people to meet him more than halfway in the later films he's daring people to meet him sometimes three quarters of the way even though the movies are messier and i think more overtly humane than the the cohen and fincher movies are i guess it's like not can i pick some movies and try and have big thoughts about them almost at the expense of the movies it's like what movies can stand up to 300 pages Mm. of exegesis not celebration right? And not just one perfect shot style uh, appreciation, though there is some of that in the way that these books are all designed. But you know, what movies can you wrestle with a little bit? Mm. What, what's the great line in Barton Fink? Uh, Want to see a, a man wrestling, uh, re- wrestling, not wrestling with his soul. Well, maybe a bit of that for the critics, you know? <laughs> um, and I, I, I find the Coen's movies are fun to wrestle with. Mm. I think Anderson's movies are fun to wrestle with. I think in Fincher's movies, it's more like you kind of bounce off them or you try and punch through them because they have this very gleaming steel box kind of kind of kind of surface to them but yeah i mean with the cohen's i guess the short version is it's fun to talk about uncertainty and in the case of anderson it's fun to look at human extremity and failure and in fincher i think it's just all about advertising i think his movies are all about a culture and a psychology of advertising and messaging 
which is kind of what he's been doing since he made that cancer PSA. Right. With the baby right. smoking the cigarette, which is what made his name in, in, in the 80s. And it's where I think you can start redeeming Mank a little bit because the failings and faults of that movie have been enumerated extremely persuasively if you go read the right pieces. It is very hard to read Joseph McBride on Mank or very hard to read some sort of more historically oriented critics on Mank and come away with much with much patience for the movie, yeah. you know, or certainly for its script. But I think that as a movie about messaging and about putting putting something out into the world and then having it sort of be reappropriated and used against you in the way that that studio resources can kind of uh, affect people's understanding of the world, the, the image making aspect of Hollywood, I think it starts becoming a bit of a richer movie, not necessarily because it's written that way, but because of how Fincher has integrated this, this, this interest of his, a long standing interest into the movie. People have said that Mank would be a better movie if it was made by another filmmaker who wouldn't necessarily defer to his late father's script so much. That may or may not be true, but it wouldn't be to me as much about advertising and 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 image making and sort of the psychology of messaging if Fincher didn't make it. Because that's what he's really interested in. This isn't something he dresses up in. This is his whole career to me. Maybe, maybe Benjamin Button doesn't fit that schema as an odd film out, but almost and, and, and it connects to his work in other ways, obviously in terms right. of history and special effects and, and Kubrick, but uh, almost all of his other movies in some ways are about advertising and getting a message out to the public and performing almost kind of social commentary in a public forum. That's what I think Gone Girl's about. Definitely what Seven and Zodiac and Fight Club are about. I mean, a hundred percent. So mm -hmm. yeah, just trying to, just trying to work that angle, I think, you know, made, made the book an interesting project. Yeah, I'm just thinking about what you said as well about Mank and, and the script. I mean, my understanding is he wasn't that respectful to his father's script that he didn't bring in a writer and... Well, oh, he know, did. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. That's the thing. He, yeah. But the bones of it, and again, I should be careful because the Fincher book hasn't come out yet. And I'm not, I, I mean, I don't dislike Mank as much as some of my, my, my colleagues do. I tried to make the best case for it in the book, sure. but he keeps the basic argument and it's an argument he had supposedly in interviews with his dad, he said for years, the basic argument about Mankiewicz and Wells and credit remains mostly intact. And while I think it's a small part of the movie, really, the Wells stuff, it's, <laughs> it's not great. No. No, you it's know, a, it's a presiding sort of falsehood, if you want to. Uh, you well, know. and it's just and, and it's just not dramatized in a way where even the slant of it or the opinion of it could could be interesting. It feels petty. And there's a pettiness sometimes to Fincher where all these movies are 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 revenge against, you know, Fox for Alien 3, which which to quote Wells on Citizen Kane, and maybe that's a bit of dime store Freud, you know, maybe. Mm. Maybe that's a bit much, but you look at the way he talked about his experience on Alien 3, where he took a job for hire and then sort of got really angry about being treated like a director for hire because he thought actually in the Wellsian sense that he should have total control. And, you know, look at all the control freaks and look at all the micromanagers that, that exist in his cinema kind of after that. And when he makes a movie that is simpatico with that sensibility, like Seven, a movie that you have to understand, the cops are the heroes, but you don't want them to catch him. You're watching Seven, you don't want them to catch him because the design is so seductive. You're like, I want to fucking see what happens. Mm. Stop getting mm. in his way. <laughs> and then and, and, and then and then when you realize that they're not getting in his way but that wonderfully double-edged moment where they find the handprints on the wall that say help me which actually is not a, a, a cry for help. It's an invitation to just keep doing what they're doing because he needs yeah. them in order to complete it. That's when you sort of see that this is a genuinely sadistic film, uh, not a particularly nice movie. But it you see what's so great about Fincher at that point in his career, and in some ways he's gotten better at that, which is that sense of convergence and trapping you inside something that's unfolding until you need to see the pieces come together. And in its way, Seven is totally satisfying. The head in the box is a totally satisfying moment. And then the fact that I'm satisfied by it makes me feel like a, a creep, you know, or or, or 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 makes you feel like the exact kind of low denominator in the audience that people accuse the movie having. Because man, how many thrillers add up? How many thrillers have any kind of calculus that's not just crossing off plot points, but where it's like, oh my God, the stakes actually raise. And every part of the movie and its ensemble and its characters and its psychology have been brought together instead of deprioritized one against the other or forgotten or left for something else. It's 
perfect structure. It's it's juvenile, you know? It's juvenile, and I don't like the last, last, last line where he says, you know, the world's a fine place and worth fighting for. And no, it's not. I mean, and, and, the, and, and, and the second part, I believe in the second part, I mean, it's really kind of gilding the lily, I think, as commentary. But you find me, I, I'm, I'm not trying to argue, I mean, you're, you're nodding, so I, I mean, maybe you just want me to stop talking so you can say the same thing. But, I mean, you find me a Hollywood thriller of that era that satisfies like that. The Usual Suspects. You, usual Suspects, but even in The Usual Suspects, which is funny because also Kevin Spacey did it. Uh, <laughs> all I would argue with The Usual Suspects is the one thing that's not satisfying is that you're, you, you're being had. Right, right. In a good way. I mean, yeah. man, I, I, don't, I, I like that movie fine. But it's more of the satisfaction of, oh my God, I was had. Whereas in Seven, it, I feel the sense of a character's victory and of the victory meaning something. Not just getting out of custody, but the victory mm. meaning something about the film world that we've spent the two hours in. Uh, I, I, I think it's like just total. Yeah, I mean, the dissatisfaction of Usual Suspects is the old, you know, the old, uh, okay, so wait a minute, did he make everything up? None of that was true. There was no such and such and not that... Um, the one thing I'd say about Seven is there's a, which I, I do, I was nodding because I agree, there's a DNA in that movie that runs all the way through and you have that very first, and I agree, the last, you know, I think the, the voiceover at the end was, was a bit of a studio cop out, but the, even at the very beginning, there's a, a line Morgan Freeman says where he says something like, yeah, look at all that passion all over those walls. And that just sort of immediate from that one line, you have the DNA of almost the entire film, which is this sort of um, sure. cynicism and nihilism, I guess, about 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 the universe, you know, about the hostility of the universe. Well, as I, I write about that line in the book in, in saying that, you know, passion on the wall, he's he's drawing a parallel also between viscera and art. Right. Mm, that, yeah. You know, and seven again is sort of about a it's sort of about a PR stunt, but also a form of performance art where, you know, you use other people's bodies as the canvas instead of your own. But, you know, I write about the the artist Chris Burden, who, you know, famously had, you know, got shot in the arm in 1971 as a piece of performance art. You know, the, the piece hinged on his own being shot. And there's something of that in Spacey's, you know, final something of that in Spacey's final gambit. I mean, it's kind of among other things. Uh, and, and you have that in the opening credit sequence with the finger with the finger tips being close you know cut off and the, the sewing together the hand stitching of the books i mean sort of a really again hyperbolic uh and non-realistic but i think very earnest consideration of, of of what it is to be an artist and an artisan and putting things together and i mean in the movie the sacrifice i guess is a moral one as mm -hmm. well as a physical one i mean you know what he's sacrificing on the altar of his art is his morality or he's asserting his morality depending on how much you're willing to read into this very teenage idea of 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 good and evil but i mean seven to me is genuinely good pulpy juvenilia like there's a reason that I, when I was 14 or 15, I kind of thought it was amazing. And then as I grew up, I've distanced from a lot of it because part of me wants to roll my eyes at the packaging of that cynicism. But now that I've sat through so many garbage thrillers made in Seven Shadow without an iota, without a fucking fraction of that skill and confidence, and since I've now come to the question of, you know, who needs morality and art? Uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I don't. Uh, I, I, I've come back to just this massive appreciation for it. It's one of those things that even though it's not wholly original, because it owes so many debts, and I talk about them in the book to Fritz Lang and to, to, to Ridley Scott and different noirs, so it's not fully original, but it's not duplicable. Right. Maybe not Maybe not as many people copied Seven as copied Pulp Fiction in the 90s, but it's somewhere in that top three or four of American movies that gave people a lot of license to try and do the same thing. Sure. L literally no one got there. No I mean, one has like come close. the Saw horror franchise, I think, yeah. wouldn't exist without Seven. And, no, know, it wouldn't. I mean, I actually, think, I actually think The Empty Man comes pretty close as a seven-ish movie where there's a satisfaction that is played out in the arrangement of elements and you get right. that sort of like it has a head in the box moment for me right but right. and it's made and it's made in a very finchery way because priors worked with david fincher for a long time but i mean seven is still the the modern the the, the modern showstopper for me of a certain kind of thriller making memories of murder is great too except that it's a, he, such a different sensibility. I mean, Memories of Murder makes me think much more of Zodiac. Zodiac, It's a yeah. sort of anti, you know, the, the cops don't do what they're, that you no, expect they them don't. to do. And, 
Well, I mean, and, ima and imagine how humbled and grateful I was that Bong wrote the foreword for this book. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. How did that come about? It came about in a very humbling, grateful way, which was that I reached out to a producer of his who, instead of ignoring the request, I mean, look, you know, it's not the worst request in the world. I mean, you know, the, the Safties did the foreword for the PTA book. I have a byline. I've interviewed Bong before. So it's not like pretending that, you know, writers are insects and filmmakers are giants or anything like that. But he's a busy guy coming off of multiple multiple Academy Awards and, you know, festival juries and all that. And his producer just said Bong would be happy to. He, director Bong would be happy to. He likes David Fincher. I sent him some of the text of the book and what he came up with is quite concise, but in its own way, what it, it shows there's one more thing that Bong Joon-ho is good at, which is film criticism. It's a mm -hmm. short little piece, but he gets at things about Fincher cinema, and even in those couple paragraphs that I think are very apt. And he does it without, without a hint of self-aggrandizement. He really seems to to respect Fincher's work. I mean, I think one of the things Bong has been, which is why it's so it was so moving to me to see him at the Oscars talking about Scorsese and some of the other nominees. Uh, he is a great celebrator of others' work, and it's not the thing where you become successful enough that you can just you know be nice about everyone and you don't want to talk shit or whatever else. And some people have already started to say that he's too nice. But if you've actually followed the career prior to Parasite, DVDs that he's appeared on, interviews that he's given, he is he is a true lover of other people's movies and he will say so. And, you know, sometimes that makes people feel like a filmmaker is edgeless or sometimes it'll make people feel like a filmmaker is kind of sucking up or whatever else. But I've always found it really, uh, really endearing in his case. Guillermo del Toro uh, also strikes me as one of those. There are certain sure. directors who feel like they're real cinephiles. And if they well, weren't directing you. films, they would be writing criticism because they would be doing something in cinema. Well, with del Toro, and I don't hesitate to say this, if I've said it in print, I can say it here, you know, I, I like everything about him except his movies. His... <laughs> his <laughs> His his presence, his his erudition. I've seen him lecture. The way he the way he props up other artists, the the collaborations he's made. I mean, this is all just like above reproach. He seems like a wonderful man, and I just I just with one or two exceptions, like I do like Kronos a lot, which I think is a hoot, and mm -hmm. I think still my favorite of his movies. And you know, maybe little passages here and there. I I'm 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 not a fan. And when I write about something like The Shape of Water, which I wrote about for Scope, and if anyone's listening. If they want to read a really negative piece on Shape of Water, look it up under my name. It reads to me like the exact photo negative of the way I write about these other filmmakers, which is not trying to be petty or mean or reductive. It's like treat the movie as a space to move around in freely, but just draw a very different set of conclusions about, I think, the relationship between calculation and earnestness and, the, to me, the narrowness of what those movies are about. I guess with with for me, when uh, the Coens play with myth, American myth, Greek myth, cultural myth, I feel like there is not a one-to-one -one ratio between what they're doing and what you take away from it. And with Del Toro, I've always thought that the nice way to describe his movies is as archetypes, or but the accurate way is as cliches. And what's the distance between those two things? Well, I don't know. We all have our own mileage. But I watched The Shape of Water, which I think is one of his worst movies, and everything in it to me means only the one thing. And when you add all those one things up in a line, I don't think they add up to much. It's like a really, really, really simple kind of calculus as a movie. That's not to begrudge other people their emotional responses or, or begrudge them their affection for certain of the elements that he's working with. But to me, there's so much labor in that to add up to something so small. But I, he's a fun director for me to write about because I think I'm seeing the movie that he's making. I'm just, it, 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 it. It's small to me. Right, right. For me. Shape of Water, I, I would not pick up any weapons to defend. Yeah, that wasn't, Hope done. <laughs> uh, that wasn't a, uh, yeah, that wasn't one of my favorites, certainly. And um, yeah, I was quite surprised when it won at Venice, actually. But uh but yeah, I, I I definitely like. I think I like his Spanish language films, um, Pan's Labyrinth and uh, The Devil's Backbone. I think are two of his strongest movies. But yeah, the Devil's and Backbone. And I really movie. like Crimson Peak, which which is a, a film that not many people like, apparently. Well, the idea of Crimson Peak is wonderful. You know, it's mm. like 
let's have a budget for castles and let's have a castles and dungeons and everyone in it is 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 un, unconscionably attractive you know both in just the physical fact of them and the way that he films them i had actually a little more patience for crimson peak than i sometimes have for his fairy tale movies like i i, I was with it for a good long part of the of, of the running time um and devil's backbone along with chronos and maybe mimic would be the the movies of his from the first half of his career or half ish of his career that I would sort of you know I, I have some some effect where there's two really good scares in Devil's Backbone that I still remember they're they're mm. good little good little shocks but I mean he's an interesting test case whether you like him or not and now this is I, I don't want to keep bad nothing him because he's a nice guy. And, and I think he's a net positive for film culture because, again, he's such a, a supporter and, and such an advocate and a scholar, all these nice things. But we're in a moment, too, where one of the things that I'm really interested in is what the, I wrote about in the scope piece is this like weird gentrification of genre where transnational cinema, the kind of cinema that plays at Cannes, to some extent at Venice, definitely in parts of Toronto. It's almost like the global language of film has more become genre cinema. And it's not even what it was in ter- sort of a Tarantino idea of genre cinema, like not a messy and an indulgent one, but a kind of very clean, mythic, allegorical kind of genre cinema. Mm. It has some of Michael Haneke's DNA in it, because I think there's a lot of Haneke's DNA in like the American elevated horror stuff. Like Haneke didn't make supernatural movies, but when I see Midsummer and Hereditary and the Robert Egger stuff and It Comes at Night, there's a lot of that Hanukkahian precision, which is a, a bit of a transition from Kubrick, who Haneke, one of the few filmmakers Haneke would admit to being influenced by and and liking, but um, Del Toro and Villeneuve and Bong, and then maybe another tier below them, you know, Nick Reffin and and someone who I like a lot, and I'm in the minority on uh, Ben Wheatley. They Yorg- all have, Yorgos Lanthimos, I would have. To Yorg- Yorg- Yorgos Lanthimos even higher up because he's yeah. had he's had more of an Oscar breakthrough than any of those guys except for Bong and Del Toro with with uh, the with the, the favorite. That's that's become a kind of transnational uh, commonplace. It's not the shaky cam naturalism of the Dardens anymore. That was sort of the early 2000s cliche and a cliche that doesn't do right by the original filmmakers because even if they've kind of faded a little bit now, I will always love and revere the Dardens for the run of films they had at the end of the 90s and the early 2000s. I love those movies. I love La Promesse. I love The Sun. I mean, that's one of my favorite movies, but that's not really the currency anymore. And so the prizes at major festivals for movies like Shape of Water, the Oscar for, for Bong Joon-ho, they occasion a lot of, I think, very florid simpering writing about film as a kind of universal language which may or may not be true but like what's being spoken by that language or what's the syntax of that language Mm. and it's a lot of kind of glossy in its way palatable genre cinema i really like parasite i have no negative thoughts about parasite or no buts about parasite but that is a movie that is packaged differently by the filmmaker than you know barking dogs don't bite was or even than memories of murder was and the guy who made chronos and the guy who made Shape of Water are obviously the same guy, but Shape of Water's got the little, you know, the little bit of humane uplift as well as the guy being dragged around by the hole in his mouth. There's a, 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 a palatability there. And even the people who are not palatable, like Nick Reffin, who's disgusting, on purpose, it's still perfumey. I mean, he literally monogrammed the opening of Neon Demon with the by NWR initials. And, you know, his movies are like perfume lines or his Yves movies Saint are like boxes boxes of chocolates, you know, Yves Saint Laurent. Funnily enough, my favorite thing he's ever made was that TV show that no one liked that he made a couple of years ago. I thought that was awesome. Too, too old to die young? Too old, too old to die young because it's so boring yeah. and overdrawn and ridiculous that it came all the way back around for me where I was like, you know what? Fine. You're not hurting anybody by going and spending Amazon's money on this like bizarre Lynchian Elroy thing. Do it. I would rather this than you playing in multiplexes with Ryan Gosling. I hate Drive. I hate it so much. One of my, <laughs> one of my, one of my least, one of my honestly least favorite movies the last twenty years. I despise it. Wow. But, but 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 too old to die young. Like go for it, man. That was what? that was fun. All those TV shows. It's like a genre now. Uh, loads of TV shows by major film directors from yeah. The- from the art festivals, the film festival circuit that nobody watches. Um, I know. Well, this is happening now to Barry Jenkins with Underground Railroad, which is a very strong piece of work. That, it's really I, I, good, but nobody's seen it. I mean, I loved it, but nobody's seen it. The De- Damien Chazelle film series in Paris. I watched the first episode. It was great. I really wanted to watch more. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't. I haven't. I'm a, I'm a walk, don't run guy with Damien Chazelle, but I, 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 I maybe crawl, don't walk. 
but I'll watch it. Uh, but no, the, <laughs> the, the, the Jenkins show is good. I haven't watched Lisi's story yet, which people say is strong. I'm very mixed on Pablo Lorraine, but sure, I'll watch him do, I'll, 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 I'll watch him do that. I'm excited be, against my better instincts. I'm excited for Kristen Stewart as Princess Diana. I, I will. Benso, which is coming to Venice Spencer. as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's another. I'm a, I'm a very much a male film critic cliche when it comes to Kristen Stewart. She's my, she's my hypothetical read the phone book kind of actress. One of my favorite movies I mean, I'm saying this favorite movie ever is dumb, but one of my favorite movies of its kind, and one that I was really proud of how I managed to write about it, I thought I wrote a good piece about it, was Adventureland, uh, which I adore. I think is so much better than any of the Apatowish movies that came out around the same time. Maybe the best Jesse Eisenberg performance, certainly the best Ryan Reynolds performance. Bill Hader and Kristen Wiig are great. But I mean, in that movie, Stuart is basically tasked with playing this like impossibly hip vulnerable object of adolescent desire she like listens to big star in a t-shirt in the swimming pool and plays husker <laughs> do in the car and you know just kind of wants to make out all summer i'm like this is the best fucking movie i've ever seen i, I would just watch that for and like the whole movie not just play, but the whole movie basically builds to like driving to go see Kristen stewart while listening to the replacements and i every time i watch the movie i'm kind of like jesus christ get out of my head movie you're ticking every box aren't you you're ticking you're, you're ticking every Everybody, this is the most sentimental male savior fantasy and you know that kind of self-deprecating geeky masculinity where it's like you know no one wants to talk to me and i'm alone and and and, and, and you know you find this person and you know can you do right by her i mean it's a it's a it's it's phony but it's also not phony with the details about class and money and work and the boringness of summertime and i just love it kind of beyond i, I love it beyond reason i love the way it's framed with two replacement songs i love big star and the cure mm. in the middle of it because I'm not a, a an 80s teenager. I was born in 81 and I'm not American. So I'm fabricating a proximity to all this stuff. It's not really me, but I love it so. Yeah, but we all do, don't we? I mean, we all, that's 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 where we go. I'm interested. It's a really interesting point you made about genre and the evolution of these movies from the Dadans to this, you know, social realism, Ken Loach, Mike Lee sort of stuff. To, to something which is more and and that idea of gentrification of genre that you said i'm really interested to i would be really interested to hear what you think of Tatain, the uh the palm door winner this year i'm looking forward to to seeing it i was somewhat cool on raw but there's clearly a filmmaker there i thought that was one of those movies that was like um a lot a lot a lot a lot a lot of stuff grafted onto a plot that felt like it really could have taken about 10 seconds i mean i'm being unfair right because that goes for a lot of other movies but she 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 accomplished some of what she set out to do in raw which was she made something that <laughs> that does not pass unnoticed you 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 can't just sort of shrug that movie off it's dealing with really raw stuff hey and hey and, and, and it's it sounds like Titane is 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 in that same vein or tapping the vein sort of even more even more deeply i guess that uh when you're talking about the gentrification of of, of genre you're sort of asking well, what does non-gentrified genre cinema looks like and that's a really long complicated answer because there's reams and reams and reams of genre exploitation movies coming out that you and i don't even see because they're all made below the line they're made for online they're made for for streaming and dvd the way stuff used to be straight to video or too gross for video or too gross for release so we really are talking about pretty rarefied air when we're talking about genre cinema in these terms but yeah. this is a sorry. Go on. No, well, I, I, the thing is, I, I, I could describe what the gentr gen, uh, gentrification looks like. It looks like having Vince, Vincent Landon, you know, one of France's most esteemed stars, yeah, yeah. who's made his name doing socially realistic films, you know, turn up as a uh, in the middle of all this madness and and enthusiastically embrace it. And that's not the same thing as Klaus Kinski slumming it in spaghetti westerns financed by german money no and 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 the 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 the, the dread name in all of this uh, inter, even though he's as american as as it gets internet the dread name in all of this is tarantino mm. right i ended up mentioning tarantino a bit in the cohen book and a lot in the anderson book not because he necessarily has a lot in common with those filmmakers but he's the bridging link Hmm. The Coens are Tarantino before Tarantino, except you know what? They're kind of safely on the margins. And when they finally break through out of the margins, it's only after Tarantino softened people up for Fargo, 
Fargo has very little to do with what Quentin Tarantino's movies are about or the way they're made, but it had Steve Buscemi swearing in it. And it had kind of like haphazard, awkward violence and quotable dialogue. That's not why it's a hit, but it didn't hurt. Mm. And the Coens predate Tarantino by a decade. And again, we're not ranking people here, but I would trade his movies for theirs in two seconds right? Mm. For, for, for me. But uh, he mainstreamed it and moved the goalposts in a way that the Coens have only ever kind of done retrospectively. I mean, Lebowski is almost as big a pop cultural nostalgic flashpoint now as some of the lesser or mid tier Tarantinos, but it's still not Pulp Fiction. And Anderson's never made something at that level either, but his career exists in the way it does because of Tarantino, because all the studios and distributors were trying to find another Tarantino, and that's how Boogie Nights got packaged. It's there in the interviews that were done at the time. Yeah. You can say Boogie Nights was a movie made from the heart, and you can say that it's a complex movie if you want, but the calculus was like 70s soundtrack and character actors and an R rating and a two and a half hour running time. It's like, we want another another Pulp Fiction. I totally agree with that. And, and I mean, I was I was at uh, university when Pulp Fiction came out. And so I went to see it and I went to see all the the films that came very quickly, you know, uh, Two Days Awful in the movies. Valley, yeah. Oh, yeah. Things Are Doing Denver When You're Dead. And I, I remember going to see things like The Usual Suspects. It's like, oh, okay, another one of these. And then and then obviously being being pretty surprised. And, and Boogie Nights, you're absolutely right, was watching that scene with Alfred Molina and the Firecrackers. Yeah you were just thinking this is Tarantino and that I don't think there's any other reason for um, Don Cheadle to to be in a shootout in a diner except they needed a bit of Tarantino-esque violence. Well and it's funny because you've just described the two scenes one of which is my least favorite which is the Cheadle scene and the the Molina scene goes so far and over the top that it comes at the other end and becomes a great predecessor to the outbursts that are incredible in later Anderson films. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I write about that scene is for all that it's derivative and for all that it's out of control, it's so scrupulously tied to the theme of uh, film being replaced by video because he's made a mixtape. He doesn't have the patience for albums. He wants instant gratification of singles off the radio in the order he wants them. And he that's very coke headish, you know? Yeah. He's not sitting back with a joint and listening to a record. He's listening to shitty top 40 80s singles. And like he, Anderson picks these three songs that are as well curated as anything in Tarantino. But Tarantino tends to use music pretty reverently. Whereas, you know, Anderson, I think, uses that music in a, in a very funny way. I mean, the slow motion realization to Sister Christian, the shootout to 99 red balloons i think it's very witty and i think the fact that it's like a shitty mixtape from a coked out instant gratification kind of you know phony is is actually tied to what that movie's about there's all kinds of undisciplined things in boogie nights but i also see the wit of the filmmaker who after that especially by the time he makes the master and inherent vice a filmmaker who i love and it is a kind of love like all the skepticism that i had at the time as a teenager of Boogie Nights in Magnolia, and I resisted Punch Drunk Love, which I don't anymore. And I resisted There Will Be Blood, because as a 25 or 26 year old going to see that with the hype that it got, I was like, no, I'm not doing this. I am not gonna let, you know, this hubristic over ambitious filmmaker, you know, I mean, I was being a dick sitting down to that press screening. I remember it. I was at the Varsity Theater in Toronto, just fully with my guard up. I had read a couple of emails from friends saying that it was quite something. and it totally, you know, wore me down. And But then when I sat and watched The Master, it was a different feeling. And it's a perverse movie to feel this way about because it's a movie filled with alienation effects. All I could think about for the two hours that I was watching The Master the first time at TIFF in 2012 was, I love this so much. Mm -hmm. Not I like it, or I admire it, or I want to return to it, not I'm going to make up my mind in the morning, but just I love it. And that feeling that, that you know, Kale called her book movie love. I mean, sometimes when I'm talking to people, I don't even care what movies it is they love. I guess there's a few deal breakers for me, but I mostly I'm just interested in why people love movies the way they do when they love them that way. And yeah. I think the whole reason I wanted to write a book about Paul Thomas Anderson in a way was to figure out what I loved about that movie which is not a lovable movie, but love's the only word I have for how I felt while watching it. That's really, I, that's fascinating because I, I think there is that love. I, I think it gets lost a lot in criticism that we we can analyze things and, and, and listening to you talk about showgirls right at the beginning and 
Oh, it I is, love show. I love showroom. Well, there you go. You see, it is that engagement, and it's almost like whether you like something or not is is relatively uninteresting. But when you love something, it it goes beyond just a rational ticking of boxes or whatever. I'll give you an example. We you talked very early on about the Coen Brothers and how you sort of recognise them yep. as sort of kindred spirits in some sense as your filmmakers. I remember going to see. I were uh, one summer. I went to see The Big Lebowski at, in Bradford at the cinema. And I basically had the day free. I was staying with friends, but they were working. So I decided I'll go to the cinema. I'll see a couple of films. And I watched The Big Lebowski and Come Done. Hmm. Not a double bill most people would do. But when I came out of The Big Lebowski, I can't even remember which. They, they must have been in Come Done and then The Big Lebowski. Yeah. When I came out of The Big Lebowski, I was just, I just felt so happy. I just had this feeling of, I want to live in that film. I want to live in the universe that that in which that film is possible and and happily i do so you know and 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 this this is when it was released so this predates any of the sort of dudeology and all the 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 kind of a little bit annoying monty python-esque sort of fandom that that surrounds it what a funny pairing because they're both about people who are nudged towards enlightenment and towards an acceptance of some kind of responsibility for their actions you know it's 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 just that in kundan Someone is born divine and has to wrestle with that. And in the, in the Big Lebowski, the divinity is sort of uh, achieved. <laughs> the, the, the divinity is, is is achieved in excruciating increments, but 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 achieved. And the rug becomes a kind of uh, what's it called a man, mandala when the oh yeah, sure it does absolutely you know, it's uh, t- it's we're tying the universe together now. Listen, I would love to talk for another hour and a no, half. No, it's and all it, good. And in fact, <laughs> you might well I might well split this into two parts because it's such a great conversation i want people to enjoy it uh, but one last thing i have to ask you Adam, yeah, yeah. is uh, what film book would you recommend to our listeners well, i mentioned this book on another podcast recently but i'll spread it around i love and it's not a new book but it's called un-american psycho by Chris Dumas, which is a book about Brian De Palma. And I wouldn't say it's an antidote to criticism about De Palma because, you know, a lot of the criticism positive and negative about him over the years has been on point. But it's a real act of movie love filtered through this very rigorous academic sensibility because Chris is a smart guy. It's a movie that argues for the the poetics, I would say, or the metaphysics of failure and self-defeat, a very political poetics about De Palma is sort of in some ways the most political of the 70s Hollywood filmmakers, the most cynical of the 70s Hollywood filmmakers, but the cynicism comes from a thwarted earnestness. It's not a cynicism about the world in the Polanskian sense that, you know, the world is bad. It's a cynicism about the world in the sense of I've tried to make it better and failed and sort of living with the consequences of that. He sketches how many of De Palma's movies are about people who reach out to help someone and fail or characters who reach out for help and and, and fail. And he also does really well, I think, to pull Hitchcock out of the De Palma narrative to deal with him and then to go more towards Godard, who obviously De Palma kind of abandons in the 70s and 80s during his Jallo phase, but who is really the guiding spirit of the late 60s work and who I think returned in a big way when he made Redacted. De Palma once, I think, said, I forget the exact quote, but something about wanting to be an American Godard. And mm. my late friend, Kevin Currier, who was a very important friend of mine and a, a real influence on me as a critic, an older, older guy than me, passed away a couple of years ago. He always said that he knew why Tarantino liked De Palma, but that they were different because Tarantino, uh, he said, Guitar turned viewers into critics and Tarantino turned critics into fanboys. Mm-hmm. And it's a bit of a broad distinction, but, you know, I think it holds. And I think that Dumas shows how thoroughly a viewer can be turned into a critic through just exposure to De Palma's films. It's not a cheerleading book. It's not a ranking book. It's not about a filmmaker being great. It's just what are these movies actually about? And it's thoroughly and truly auteurist in the sense that it pulls together visual motifs, thematic motifs, similarities in acting and multi-directionally throughout the point of throughout the course of his career it's not thorough there's a good 15 De Palma movies he doesn't write about at all like he doesn't really write about Carrie for instance which is a famous one right and he doesn't really write about the untouchables but the ones he does write about 
if you care about this filmmaker, like Hi Mom and Greetings and Fan of the Paradise, and especially about Blowout and Dress to Kill and Casualties of War and then Redacted again at the end, if you care about this filmmaker, it's a, it's a brilliant book. Excellent. Excellent. So that's Un American Psycho. Un, 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 un American Psycho. I hope that at least one or two of your listeners will seek it out and order it. It's not out of print, it's available online. It's not that expensive. It's a really, really great book. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. And 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 you know, congratulations on your books. I've read the the Cohen's book and I've read the Paul Thomas Anderson book. Uh the Showgirls book, I'm now gonna order. <laughs> And uh, I'm looking forward. Right, right, right on. That's another, you know, eight cents for me or whatever it is at this point. <laughs> Don't go silly. That's, Don't that's go my, silly. That's my, that's my fee. For, but, but no, I want to thank you for, for inviting me on. It's very fun to talk about writing as well as about the, the movies. And uh, this was a great pleasure. Thank you. So that was our conversation, me and Adam. I think we got into quite a lot of subjects. We covered a hell of a lot of ground, a lot of filmmakers and a lot of ideas. All that remains is for me to remind you that the recommended book that Adam gave us was Un American Psycho, Brian De Palma and the Political Invisible by Chris Dumas. I should also thank Ellie Atkins for the music and Ali Harwood for the artwork. Until next week, take care.